one. Hey, what's up? Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Roll Pod, an Alabama sports podcast from Bama 247. I'm Cody Goodwin, joined today by our senior writer for 247 Sports, John Talty. John, here to recap Alabama's 34-20 to win over Tennessee. Brian Denny Stadium full of cigar smoke by the end of the game on Saturday. I think people started lighting them up with about five minutes left. Um, not long after Chris Braswell sack, which led to Jihad Campbell's scoop and score to put Alabama up two scores with about, you know, midway through the fourth quarter. Sneaking a cigar into Brian Denny Stadium, I feel like is pretty easy. But there's a few people that I know that also like snuck their cutters in, which is like, you know, like that's kind of sharp. It could be viewed as a weapon. How how are you getting that into Brian Denny Stadium? Like I'm I think I'm more impressed by that than maybe the number of cigars I saw. Yeah, I don't want to be a narc here, Cody. Um, <laughs> but you know, I think that's uh impressive. Um yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I've uh, you know, I've only uh I've only experienced the rivalry uh from the press box, so I've never never been down there. Uh, but it, it is it's funny and it's weird when like all of a sudden you just there's just like a, a waft of smell you're like man that's cigar smoke and then you look and you s- just see all these people in the stands start lighting them up and it's just i don't know it's just a very it's a very cool scene it's a very cool tradition um and i, I agree i think around five minutes started happening and i feel really around like around like the two minute mark where it just felt like it was everywhere and you saw just the cloud of smoke kind of start to uh, kind of envelope the stadium and you know you're like oh wow i can I'm going to be feeling this tomorrow, even though I'm not smoking a cigar. Um, but, you know, I think Alabama fans, you know, they didn't they didn't get to smoke one last year. It had been 15 years straight. You know, I think they were missing their cigars and uh, it definitely lit them up yesterday. And Brian Denning and, you know, around the country as had multiple friends text me photos of them smoking cigars last night. I'm still very new, obviously, like I'm learning about all these SEC traditions and stuff. So, like, I went down the rabbit hole this past week, just kind of like. How did this cigar tradition start? Like kind of cool, like looking back at it, it's a tradition that's closing in on, you know, I mean, it's more than 50 years old now, but then to like see it up close, like in person, it's like, oh, okay. Like this is kind of cool. Like I finally got down to the field with about two minutes left. Tennessee was on their last offensive drive. Um, And yeah, you just like, you know, I'm sitting there like taking video or like reading tweets or whatever. And then it's just, oh, that's what that yeah. is. Okay. Yeah. Like, and then you look up and kind of like you said, like there's just, you know, not like a cloud, but you could, you could see a haze. Like you could tell that they were celebrating. For sure. Yeah. And, you know, I think it was, it was funny kind of talking to some of the players after the game and, you know, if it probably more disliked or didn't want to do it than not. Um, and it's understandable. I mean, these guys are world-class athletes and, you know, they're not probably used to smoking cigars. And so, I'm sure they're like, oh, this is a little weird, but it, I think it's. I think they obviously enjoy it, and they all, you know, smoke them if you got them. They post the photos, and it's fun. And it was fun seeing, you know, uh, post game when Nick Saban got handed that cigar, and him just kind of laughing and putting it in his mouth and running off. It was, you know, a, a fun scene. You on you this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, it's just, you know, I think uh, an exciting, an exciting, you know, game, an exciting moment, and you could just tell the team. Um, Nick Saban. I don't know, just like watching them on the sidelines during that game. More, I feel like we saw more excitement than I feel like I've seen in a while. You know, like them going wild on the fourth down stops. I was, you know, on the sideline at the end of the game. And uh, when they got that that stop, you know, to essentially end the game, they are probably going to win, but they got that stop again. And uh, just saw, you know, like Malik Benson and, and Kendrick Law and other guys like, you know, dancing and just, they were having a great time. Like they, those those guys were really excited to win this game. And I think it it did really mean a lot to them to, you know, to avenge the loss from last year. Yeah. And I was reminded of, you know, like we're dealing with college athletes here, right? Like there's, there's going to be a level of emotion that plays into some of these games. Cause some of these guys, you know, they either grow up rooting for the school that they are now playing for, or they become engrossed in the school that they're now playing for. So like these rivalries become very real things. And Saban's even said like, you know, he's never been like, don't play with emotion, like just focus on the task, do this, do that. He's like, no, like you, if you got emotion, that's cool. Just channel it into something super productive. And I think right. at least in the second half of yesterday's game, that was something that we saw Alabama do, right? They rallied from down 20 to seven at halftime, ultimately beat Tennessee 34, 20, um, Saturday night inside Bryant Denny first half, Joe Milton played 
out of his mind. Tennessee's quarterback volunteers look like they might run away from the tide, effectively end their season in front of the home crowd. But then in the second half, Alabama's offense woke up, defense settled down, uh, tide rattled off 27 unanswered points. Defense pitched a second half shutout. Um, things really came together in the second half. And I, you could tell by the way they were celebrating that obviously this win meant a lot, especially after the way it went last year in Knoxville, snapping a winning streak. This has kind of been a series of streaks. Alabama halted Tennessee from starting a new streak. Um, let's start there, John. What's kind of your initial reaction, uh, instant takeaway from yesterday's game? Yeah, I mean, it's just – I think we've said it a few times on this show, but I mean, this this is what this team is. You know, it's a roller coaster. It's a yo yo. Whatever you want to, whatever kind of analogy you want to make, I, I've mostly used roller coaster. But that's just, I think, what this team is. They're they're going to be up. They're going to be down. A lot of times, it can happen play to play. Um, it's I don't fully understand it. I don't know if Nick Saban fully understands it. I think that you can highlight the positive of the fact this team is resilient and that they can go down. 20 to seven and the stadium feels morose. And I think the, the obits are starting to be written up uh, or pulled from the file to get ready to go. And, and then they come out and they just explode and it feels like a completely different team. And it's like, where was this team in the first half? And that's, I have felt that way numerous times watching this team this year where they will do something like that was really bad. And then they do something else like, wow, that was really good. How, like, how is this the same team? And that's, just who they are. Um, I think that they are a team that at times can underachieve, at times can overachieve. Like I don't think they are a dominant team by any stretch. I don't think that they have so much talent that they can just overwhelm teams the way they used to. They're, they're going to be in a fight every game. And I, I think that the benefit is that they've been there before. They have had to come back. They've had to fight. And they now, I think there's a growing confidence amongst this team that maybe in the past might have folded or just was just not used to being in a situation like, yeah, like unfortunately we've been here before we can find a way to get ourselves out of this hole. And that's what we saw in the second half. And I was talking to someone about this last night, like when they came out, I know we're going to talk about it in more detail in a second, but when they came out the way they did in the second half, like it felt like that was the game right there. It was either they're going to come out and look really good and be like, all right, this team is here or they're going to go three and out. And it's like, yeah, this team's done. And the way they came out, the way they scored in two plays, I immediately felt like Alabama's winning this game. It just felt like it all switched in that moment. And then from there on, obviously, it, that proved accurate. But I was really encouraged by what I saw in the second half. And I would say I was concerned about what I saw in the first half. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. And I, I, it's funny, the reaction coming out of halftime, like literally a night and day difference because you remember the end of the first half, right? Like they get a fourth down stop. They have an opportunity to, at the very least, probably get a field goal, right? They're within range. Milrow takes a shot to the end zone. Tennessee secondary makes a really good play, right? Like tip pass, second, you know, defender corrals an interception. And then Tennessee immediately turns that into an 80-yard touchdown. And so instead of it being 13-10 Tennessee at halftime, it's 20-7. to And we're all just kind of sitting like, I mean, you, you know, cracking jokes about people writing Alabama's obit. I was giving Mike Rodak some trouble because he had 500 words on the page. And I'm just like, you're writing the obit, aren't you? And he's just like, got to have it ready. And then they came out in the second half and it's just like, okay. Um, You know, and it's, you know, as soon as they scored, it was like, all right, this is going to be interesting. And then as soon as they got the second stop or the first stop in the second half, um, that's when I'm like, okay, like this, this just got really interesting. And, you know, it took them a minute. Um, Took the lead on Jace McClellan's five-yard touchdown run, um, added a field goal after that, and then the defense iced it um, when Chris Braswell sack, which led to Jihad Campbell's fumble return touchdown. Um, My instant reaction, like, it's more – we talked about the home run or bust nature of this team, specifically the offense last week. Like, you know, and I know Saban has said multiple times that, like, this this is a younger team. Um, I think they're younger in key areas, right. Or at least inexperienced, right. You look at, you know, quarterback Milrow, this is first full season starting, um, you know, offensive line, they've had to replace some key pieces and they've had to shuffle that line around, um, you know, maybe a little inexperienced at certain other spots, you know, but like they, like this is a good team, right? Like there's, there's a lot of talent on this team, even if it's kind of taken some time for them to kind of come together, um, 
you know? And so like when you've got the combination of like a lot of talent, but also like not a ton of experience, at least at key positions, like it's going to kind of yo-yo like that, like to yeah. use your term. And so, you know, like with age comes a little bit more consistency, like you kind of understand the strengths and the weaknesses a little bit better. And, you know, this team just is just kind of I don't like my initial reaction. Like I told you before we hit record, it was just kind of like shrug, you know, like they, you know, after a while, you you knew they were probably going to figure it out. And then they did. And I because that's maybe the one thing about this team that has been, I would argue, the most impressive part is that even when they look bad, it's like well, they got a track record of figuring it out, you know, or they, you know, even if they figure it out early and stumble late, like they did against Arkansas, it's like, okay, you got trust in the defense that they'll, you know, get the stop that they need and they'll, they'll figure it out and get the win. And I don't know, like, it's just, I, it's, it just comes back to, I guess the word I keep coming back to is just, it's a very entertaining team. Like it is not the joyless murder ball team of Saban's teams past, but like, it's fun to watch, man. Like you just, you never know what you're getting, you know, week to week, sometimes play to play. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think, and I think, you know, Saban said it after the game, like, I think he enjoys, it's a unique challenge for him. And I think like uh, Nick Saban joked that, you know, this team has probably taken some years off of his life. I think you could probably, a lot of Alabama fans would say the same um, because they're just not used to it. You know, they're not used to kind of the chaotic nature of this team where, there are moments you think this team's going to like lose every game it plays. And then other times like, we're never going to lose again. Like it's just like, it flips so fast. And like, it's kind of funny whether on social media, whether on our message boards, whether it's friends texting us, just like some of the texts you get in first half of games from Alabama fans and they're just freaking out. And then the second half, it's like, we are the best team in the world. Like it just, it's just funny <laughs> watching them. And that's just, I think the fans are kind of embracing the yo-yo nature a little bit too, of just like just some ups and downs trying to, trying to watch them uh you know figure this out but you know i think it's there, there's some positives for sure from you know them finding finding ways to to win these games and um again clearly they're not they've been there before so they know the way out i think is one of the the big takeaways for me yeah that's uh i, th- I think that's important for you know especially since there's a lot you know everything is still in front of them. So there are still a lot more bigger games that could potentially be coming down the pike, including one that we'll talk about here in a little bit um, right after the bye week. Uh, But let's start with uh, kind of a deeper look at the offense from Saturday's game. Alabama finished the game 358 total yards of offense. This was largely a tale of two halves. Like we've been talking about first half uh, Crimson Tide opened up back-to-back punts, managed just 133 total yards of offense, scored seven points and turned the ball over twice in the second half. They woke up. 225 yards, scored on four consecutive drives, averaged seven yards per play, um, fueled 27 unanswered points scored. John, uh, as we always start when we talk about the offense, what is one thing you liked about the way they played? I like the aggressiveness in the second half. I mean, there's not going to be much to really like in the first half. Um, and we'll talk about that in the second part of this discussion. But I, I think in the first half, again, we we're talking about it earlier, just the way they came out of the half, I thought was really important. Um, taking that shot early to Isaiah Bond, I think that really was a momentum changer. Uh, I thought that the the play calling as a whole was better in the second half. I thought Jalen Milrow seemed to be more at ease in the second half. I think he was you know, able to it just felt like at times in the first half, he couldn't really see the field. I don't know. Like he, he wasn't really sensing, wasn't doing a good job of maybe sensing the blitz or the pressure. And it just, it just didn't seem like he was trusting himself on his reads and what he was seeing. And I feel like in the second half, he did a much better job at that. I like, they had a nice designed run. Um, I think we're in there in the red zone, which I thought was smart. I think we've been kind of waiting to see like, why doesn't, why don't we get this guy up and run in a little bit more? So I just thought that as a whole in the second half, there was a lot to, to like um, across the board. I mean, Jace had some good runs. Again, Bond had that touchdown. I think Jermaine Burton had a few big catches in the second half. It just felt like they were able to just be more effective in the pass game, more effective in the run game. And in general, it just felt like we were talking about this before, you know, the, the pod, and you, I'll let you make the point, but, you know, some of the statistics almost – don't make it look like it was so much better in the second half, but just felt like they were much more in rhythm in the second half than they were in the first half. Yeah. I think the, they, the plays were maybe a little bit more impactful. You know, you look at like Jalen Milrose line, for example, um, you know, cause he, I think the way he played in the second half was what I liked about, you know, 
the offense, I guess, because it just it kind of helped the whole operation hum a little bit more. You look at his stats in the first half. It went 10 of 14, 117 yards and a touchdown. It's pretty good. He it finished good. 14 of 21, which means he went, what's that, four of seven for, yep. you know, 103 yards in the second half. Like, it's not great, but he went, you know, so okay, final stat line, 14 of 21, 220 and two touchdowns. Big thumbs up. Uh, he went five for 39 rushing. Um, and the chunk, a big chunk of that was in the second half. Um, right. you know, he had what three runs of 10 plus yards, um, including a 15 yard scramble play on, you know, pretty big third and 10 on what ultimately became a 15 play drive that ate up eight minutes and resulted in a field goal by Will Reichard. Um, I just, I like the way that, that Milrow just kind of adjusted in the second half. And, and some of this is coming from, you know, I haven't rewatched the game yet, but some of this was coming from Nick Saban. Um, where he was like, you know, sometimes you need a moment to, um, you know, or you need a half to try and, you know, figure out what the other, how the other guy is playing you, right? He's used the point guard analogy with Milrow quite a bit this season, um, you know, and he used it again last night after the game, you know, like, hey, if the defense is kind of, you know, sagging off a little bit, you step back and shoot the three. Um, if they're, you know, guarding the, you know, man in the post, you drive around them. Like sometimes you just need to see what the defense is doing first, and then that allows you to adjust. I think we saw that from Milrow yesterday, right? He took three sacks in the first half. Um, the worst one probably being like a really weird option play where he ended up keeping it. And like Tennessee just snuffed it out all the way. And he ended up, you know, pretty big sack that took Alabama out of field goal range. Um, in the second half, I thought he was, you know, a lot better. Um, you know, I mean, he, a couple option read keepers on those runs. The other thing Saban mentioned too, is that like when you've got edge rushers like that, like you need to be smart about when to step up in the pocket. Um, thought Milrow did that, especially on the first touchdown pass to Isaiah Bond. Like it was, you know, the edge rushers flew by him. He took a step up, cocked and through, and, you know, Bond got behind the secondary wide open. Like I just, the way, you know, the stats may not reflect it, but just, I feel like the plays he made in the second half were a lot more impactful, um, you look at some of these other stats that might help back that up in the first half, Alabama went two of six on third downs, um, three of seven in the second half. So like not great, but like all three of those came on that 15 play drive where they ate up basically half a quarter. And by the end of it, they, you know, had extended it to a full possession lead 27, 20. So, um, yeah, I just I like the way, you know, and Milrose kind of showed us this, that like over the course of a game, he will find subtle ways to adjust and, you know, plays that, turn into losses in the first half or earlier in the game will turn into positive plays at the very least um, later in the game or in the second half. And I thought he was key to, you know, the way the offense was able to kind of wake up a little bit in the second half against Tennessee. Well, and, and not that I put either one of them a hundred percent on him, but you know, first half, two turnovers, second half, zero turnovers. And that might be the stat that Nick Saban cares about the most. So, you know, I think that there's, you know, Again, obviously, there were, there were opportunities to score points on that interception, which, you know, I think it was a combination of good defense. I think Burton could have done more in that moment. But, you know, you have to put some of it on Milrow as well. I mean, I think there might be equal blame there. But, you know, no major mistakes in that way in the second half. And sometimes that's the difference, you know, where Alabama is able to get a scoop and score for a touchdown and, and, and Miller didn't make that mistake in the second half. Yeah, Tennessee took both of those turnovers and scored 10 points, and they led by 13, and then no turnovers. Second half shutout, Alabama does the job. What is one thing you did not like about Alabama's offensive performance on Saturday? Yeah, I feel like I harped on this a bit last week, but I'm just going to you know keep the trend going. Just the slow starts from this offense, it's a bit confounding to me. Um, they again punted on their first offensive drive of the first game. First two drives. Yeah, right, but... Yeah, absolutely. And you, you're you right in the stats. I was going just opening drive. You were, I remember jotting down stats for the first two drives, and neither one of them is particularly good. But for their opening drives now, that's they've now punted five times, interception, one touchdown, one field goal. So that's just not good. Again, I think when you talk to coaches and you see the really great offensive coordinators, like sometimes they almost – make themselves look better than they really are just because they're so good at coming up with a great script to start a game. And I just have not seen that. I don't, it doesn't make full sense to me. I don't know why this team continues to start very slow on offense. It felt like they came out flat today. Um, it felt like, to be honest, as good as it was at the end. And, you know, I wrote, wrote about it. Like I felt like the crowd was a little flat at the beginning. I just felt like everybody just came out a little flat. And, and I think that the offense uh, was certainly a big part of that. So 
I don't know what the fix is. Obviously, they've got a bye week coming up. There's an opportunity to do some self-scouting, some self-evaluation, try to figure out why do we keep finding ourselves in this position. But uh, at a certain point, you know, when we talk about some of the games they have coming up, you know, you're going to have to be able to put up some points. You're going to have to be able to sustain some drives and not immediately give the team, you know, the ball back and put more pressure on your defense, which is, you know, what has happened in a lot of these games, including against Tennessee. So that's that's the thing that I think has been an ongoing problem for this Alabama team. I haven't seen a solution yet, and I think that's something that they're going to have to figure out uh, sooner than later. Yeah. Um, second game in a row, Alabama's gone punt, punt to start the game. Um, also, the third time in the last four games and fourth time in the last six games that they've started punt, punt. On their first two possessions over the last six games, they have scored a grand total of six points. Um, not great. Not yeah. great at all. Um, and even if you extend it all the way back, like Middle Tennessee, they went touchdown, touchdown. But like Texas, interception, field goal. South Florida, punt, punt. Ole Miss, field goal, punt. Mississippi State, punt, punt. a and punt, field goal. Like you get the picture. Like it's just, it's weird because like you said, usually the script, like the opening 15, those are the best plays. Like, right. you know, if you can get 14 points out of the first 15 plays, like you're usually sitting pretty and Alabama's like not getting anything. And it's just so weird. And again, we'll hit on this when we, you know, get to kind of the spinning forward part of the show near the end. But like LSU is coming up after the bye week. That is the best offense in the country uh, in terms of total offense, in terms of points. And I don't know that you can just literally and figuratively punt your first two possessions against an offense like that. Like right. I know you've got a lot of trust in the defense. And again, we'll we'll touch on this a little bit more. And obviously we'll dig into it after the bye week. But um you know, falling behind 20 to seven against Tennessee is one thing falling behind against LSU like that may not be a hole you can dig out of. We'll see. We'll see. And if so, then we'll recalibrate our recalibrated expectations. But um, yeah, it's not great. It's not great. Um, I think on top of that, like as much as I liked the the fact that Jalen Milrow can make adjustments, um, I don't like the fact that he has to take a half to do that sometimes, right. which is probably what I don't like. Um, you know, because like, I mean, he got sacked three times in the first half. He only got sacked four times total. So I guess, you know, shout out Alabama's offensive line for their own adjustments. Um, you know, some of that could have been the over aggressiveness from Tennessee's pass rushers. And, you know, maybe before the game, I gave the secondary a little bit more credit than maybe I should have. I don't know. Like Texas, I, I thought because of Tennessee's pass rushing ability that maybe Alabama could use a similar game plan that they used against Texas A&M because they right. were just kind of similar, right? Like, find a way to withstand the pass rush and take some shots. Alabama didn't really do that, but they, as the game wore on, they did a lot better against Tennessee's pass rush. And, um, you know, but just like falling into a hole like that, like having to take a quarter or two quarters to learn and make adjustments. Like it's great because you can see that the guy is getting better Jalen Milrow, but it's also like, you know, at some point again, you're not going to be able to dig out of the hole. And so it's just like, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I did like that they woke up. Um, I just didn't like that they slept walk through a half to get there. Um, it's just it's very interesting with this Alabama team because they either it's you you know the explosion or the wake up is coming when it comes to the offense. You just don't really know when. Like against right. Tennessee it was in the second half. Against Arkansas it was in the second quarter. Um, you know, against Texas it was kind of wherever. USF it was nowhere because Milrow wasn't playing that game but against Ole Miss it was kind of you know second third quarter against Mississippi yep. State they had spurts throughout the game like you you know you're going to get probably four five six maybe seven drives of pretty competent offensive play you just don't know where it's coming um which again yo-yo boomer bust home runner strikeout like that's just kind of the nature of this offense um so I, I want to see more consistency because I think that's what they're going to need but at this point they are what they are so I just don't know that we're going to get it for sure I agree um, the defense, similar to the offense, um, started slow, allowed 20 points, 275 yards in the first half. Tennessee was on pace at one point to run 92 plays for north of 500 yards of offense. Um, but then the defense settled in, pitched the second half shutout. They sacked quarterback Joe Milton three times, even scored points of their own. Chris Braswell sacked Milton, forced a fumble. Jihad Campbell scooped and scored. What is one thing you liked about the way Alabama's defense played on Saturday? Yeah, I think it's, you know, when we were talking about this earlier, you know, like there, there's not a ton that I, I didn't like. Um, but I think big picture wise, I just felt like they were able to be 
more effective um, in impacting Joe Milton in the second half. It felt like in the first half, uh, we're not particularly aggressive. You know, they went really aggressive on that third down blitz um, that ultimately did not work out in their favor and resulted in, in a Tennessee touchdown, um, which was a pretty big play at the time. We thought, man, this is this the dagger, you know, for them to go up 27 heading into halftime. I didn't think they played particularly poorly in the first half, but I just didn't think that they were able to do that much against Milton. He had a lot of time. He was able to really just dissect. Um, you know, he was definitely trying to get the ball out fast, no doubt. But I do think he there were times where he felt like he had more time than he should have. In the second half, I thought they were able to do a much better job of just getting around him, making an impact. Obviously, the the Braswell play was really, I think, the highlight for the defense. But just overall, I feel like they were able to to, to do more. I think they handled the pace of Tennessee better. Um, I think they and they kind of rattled Tennessee. I think and some of the decisions, particularly that you know fourth and one call, um, that kind of mind boggling the way that that was the call that Josh Heupel came up with, but give Bama a lot of credit for stopping it. And that was, again, another kind of big momentum shift. So, you know, this is a defense that it's not going to be historically dominant, but it is very good. And I think that you can trust that they will keep you in the game for the most part. There can be some busts. There can be mistakes. It happens. You know, there was clearly they, they gave up some points in the first half. Um, but I didn't think, that, again, I didn't think they played horribly. I just, it wasn't their best. And I think in the second half, we saw more of what, you know, more of what the ceiling probably is for this defense. And I mean, second half shutout against a team like that with what they're capable of doing is pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, you know, the big thing, obviously, that we were keying in on coming into this game was that Tennessee has the best rushing offense in the country. Um, they bludgeoned Texas A&M, like a pretty good Texas A&M front seven for 230 yards last week. Um you know, they came in average in close to six yards a carry. Alabama held them to 133 total yards rushing, um, which obviously accounts for, you know, sacks and whatnot. Um, for the game, when you adjust for sacks, Tennessee still only had 160 yards rushing, um, you know, just on about four and a half yards a carry. They did really well, um, you know, and I think I, the one thing that I probably liked about the way that the defense played was that they just they they kind of trusted their base personnel like it took a half for them to get there but like even Saban said you know like they they tried to play a certain way to you know cuz Tennessee does those really wide splits right like they use literally all 53 yards they use the entire width of the field um like even to the point where like when I was watching it live I'm like that is just so unnecessary but it is just it, it's it's effective right. when Tennessee calls the right plays and for a while, like, I don't even know that they had to call the right plays in the first half. Like, Alabama just – the way that they tried to counter it was they decided to only put, like, use, like, three down linemen, and they wanted a few more backers and DBs just kind of in space, and um, it didn't work out. Like, a lot of those Tennessee offensive linemen were able to get to the second level, and they were – I mean, they were killing them. Um, you know, 275 yards of offense in the first half. Tennessee was averaging four yards of carry. Joe Milton was tearing him up. He had his first nine passes. Like it was just, it's like, okay, like this is Tennessee's probably going to run them out of their own building. Right. And then it was kind of capitalized where they turned the Milro interception into 10 plays and their 10 plays, 80 yards in like two minutes. Like they just marched right down the field. And then in the second half, this is, this is what I liked is that Saban just like, no, we're going to go back to what we do best, which is just, you know, you got your two down linemen, you got your two edge rushers, and just play your base defense, and they shut them down. It's like, what were you trying to do, man? Like, trust your guys, right? Like, and it's, you know, it took them a half to figure it out, but, like, I think just more confirmation that, like, this defense is good, man. Like, they're really impressive. They're good enough to position Alabama to get them to where they want to go, and we see that now, right? Like, Alabama 7-1, and one, they're undefeated against the SEC. Literally everything is still in front of them, I think, in large part because the defense – keeps them in these games and we saw it you know it took them a half to figure it out but after they adjusted they only allowed Tennessee to have 37 total yards of offense um you know they sacked Milton three times they you know I had four straight three and outs I'm pretty sure or at least you know three and out they forced a turnover three and out they you know fourth down stop like they had two fourth down stops I mean I think Tennessee ended up going 0 for three on fourth down but like yep. those two fourth and shorts against a team that runs really really well um they just and just bodied him up and said, nope, not happening. Um, you know, so like, I think I, the one thing I like is that, you, you know, this defense as constructed, it's base defense, the personnel they got there. Um, 
it's very good and it's very impressive. And I to beat this Tennessee team the way that they did in the second half, like just further confirmation that this is I don't know if it's an elite defense, but it's a championship caliber defense. Like they're very good. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. And it, it is just kind of funny thinking back on the game now. Like when early on you've got Chris Braswell trying to cover Squirrel White. You're like, oh man, this is gonna be a bad day for Alabama. Like if they're <laughs> able to set this up, poor Chris Braswell trying to cover a slot receiver who's their top receiver. Uh, and he actually didn't do that bad of a job, but it was still it's just like, man, this is just this is not good. But like you said, yeah. they you know, they went back to I think more of what they knew. They had Chris Braswell do more of what he does, and I think that worked out in, in a big way, obviously, in the second half. Yeah. And that was kind of, you know, when Saban was saying, you know, like we, we were trying to, I'll find the exact words, but he was, you know, he, he basically said that they tried to shift the defense so that they could try and stop the run a little bit better. Um, you know, and a result like that is sometimes you get Chris Braswell who plays more linebacker than edge rusher in those defensive personnel sets. Um, he gets paired up with the slot receiver and like Braswell's a freak athlete. Like the dude runs 22 miles an hour. He has made impact play after impact play for Alabama this season. He's going to make an NFL team very, very happy, whether it's, you know, day two in the second round or perhaps even late day one. Um, Squirrel White on Chris Braswell is a matchup every single time, 10 times out of 10, and good on Josh Heupel and Joe Milton for recognizing that and yep. hot routing it, and it's just – it's easy touchdown. Like, it blew yep. my mind. That it's I was I was alongside you. Like, if if that's the kind of play that they're drawing up on the first drive, it's like Alabama's in for a really long day. Yep, exactly. Give Saban credit, obviously, for going back to what they do. And I'll here's the here's the exact wording uh, from what Saban said in the beginning of the game. We were trying to play odd uh, because we were really trying to stop the run. They hit the big pass. We were in odd. Didn't play the coverage exactly right on that first touchdown. But as the game went on, we played a little bit more even. Started playing the things we had played in the past. Players did a really good job. Settled in, obviously, and shut them down. Um, you know, Milton got out of rhythm after that really hot start. I think at one point he, what he started nine for nine. And then I think he went like three of his next nine. Um, you know, obviously he was getting harassed a little bit and, you know, th this wasn't the best pressure game or sack game. Um, you know, but the, the few pressures that Alabama was trying to send, especially in the second half, once they kind of got back to their base personnel, it worked, right? Like Deontay Lawson yeah. was able to get in there on some blitzes. Jihad Campbell obviously had a great game. The run defense did well. Um, you know, Tim Keenan, who was injured early in the game, came back and he played really well against the run. Um, yeah, I just I like the fact that they could revert back to their base defense and things went swimmingly after a really, really rough first half. What's one thing you did not like about the way the defense played? I kind of feel like I said it. I mean, I think I, I kind of already feel like I hit on it. I don't think I need to add a ton more on it. I just think that, you know, the first half, I think there were obviously some struggles, whether it's coverage or um, just trying to impact Milton and I think that was that was their issue you know I mean I think I would say specifically what you just said scroll white on Chris Braswell is what I did not like that was the play that I was like this is bad oh man dude that gave me that that like um I'm a Chiefs fan I think people know that by now that reminded me of like some random Chiefs Pittsburgh Steelers playoff game from way back when where like somehow some way Justin Houston superstar edge rusher was paired up on Antonio Brown and like, I'm just picturing them running down the field and Brown's got 10 yards on Houston and Houston's like, ah, what am I doing here? He's like a fish out of water. Brown catches the ball first down chiefs lose naturally. Like that's what, like that, that's what that play reminded me of. Like I had visions of that again. And I was yeah. just like, I'm like, that's not good, man. Like that is, I've seen this movie before. It's not great. Um, but Hey, credit, Alabama's defense for just, you know, going back to what they do. It's amazing what happens when you do things that you're good at, right? Yeah. Like I think Alabama learned that I think on both sides of the ball in this game. Um, yeah, that was one thing that I disliked that they just, I, th I feel like they, and Saban even admitted as much. I think they, they just tried to, they didn't try to get too cute, but I think they, you know, the, the, the original game plan that they had, um, you know, Hypel obviously, Hypel and Tennessee obviously had pretty good counters to what they thought Alabama would try to do. And then Alabama reverted back to what they do well. And it obviously worked out. Um, there were a they lot of plays. You know, do what? I think they overcompensated. You know, I think that's what it was. Yeah. And then they realized, like, let's just do, do us, you know? Yeah. Like, it's a good defense. Like, just, just let them do their thing. <laughs> um, yeah. 
there were there were a lot of plays in Saturday's game that ultimately dictated the outcome, especially in this topsy turvy one. In your mind's eye, which do you believe was the play of the game? Yeah, I'm going to go with what I think is. I think there are two obvious ones, and I'll take one of them. Uh, I think it's the Chris Braswell, Jihad Campbell one two. Um, I think at that point, you know, Alabama was feeling good, but it's still a one score game. Um, you know, the offense had slowed down a little bit. You know, had to take a a Will Reichard field goal, threw up 27-20. Tennessee, we know how, you know, even if they're struggling, they still have that firepower. So to get, you know, the the non-offensive touchdown, it felt like that was the moment where every Alabama fan in the stadium probably started thinking, where's my cigar? You know, like, let's like, let's start getting it ready because that, it just, there was an explosion in that stadium and then it went right into Dixieland delight. And it was, that place was going wild. And, you know, I know Cody, this is only your first year, but I would, I would have to imagine that's probably the loudest moment. I would think not to speak for you, but probably the loudest moment that I've seen so far in the stadium this year. And probably the last couple of years, you know, there's just not always those moments where the place is going nuts. But I thought that that play Dixieland delight, all that was just, it was just, going wild and that was the moment where he felt like Alabama is gonna win this game you know I already thought they were going to but that secured it to me it was like they're not giving up 14 points in the last seven minutes of this game they're just not gonna do it so that yeah, to me is no. uh the play the play of the game I think yeah no hard to argue um it was the perfect mishmash of things right because at that point Alabama had the lead the crowd had some juice to it and then Braswell like he has so often this season comes off the edge makes a play Jihad Campbell takes it for a touchdown um, and then, I, yeah, it was beautiful the way it played right into Dixieland Delight, which is, you know, it's a song about Tennessee, but like Alabama obviously has turned it into, you know, one of their songs and it was phenomenal as I was walking out of Brian Denny at the, you know, later on Saturday evening, like the song was still playing. Like I could hear it on the strip. I could hear it through the apartment complexes that are right there near the stadium as I was walking to my car, like, um, it was just like the perfect mishmash. And you could tell at that point, it's like, all right, you can control alt delete your, you know, losing game stories. Alabama's probably going to ice this thing away. Um, also shout out to Chris Braswell, like not kidding when it's like that dude just does nothing but make big plays. He had the pick six against Mississippi state. He had the blocked field goal that probably should have been a touchdown against Texas A&M. And then the sack that forced the fumble that led to the scoop and score. Um, against Tennessee that ultimately flipped that game. Like for a dude that had to wait his turn, he is balling out this season, but like not just statistically, like the dude has a knack for coming up in big moments too. He's an all American, and, you know, I know that Dallas still gets more of the attention understandably. So, but Braswell is an all American player this year. And I think he, you could argue he's been potentially one of, I would say top three most important players on this team. Um, just in the, the leap that he's taken, like you said, those big, momentous, game-changing plays, this is a guy who's delivered multiple of them. Um, and that that's crucial. You know, they this is not a team that has such a huge margin of error. Like, they need a guy like that. They need guys who can make those big plays, especially on defense. And, um, and, and he delivered. And I think that was, you know, it was huge. Yeah, 100%. Um, I think my play of the game, I'm going to take the other obvious one. Um, and that was Milrow to bond Isaiah bond 46 yard touchdown to kick off the second half. Shout out to Nestler. I think who had that call. That was, that was pretty good. Um, but yeah, I mean, just second half, I Saban even said it like it wasn't a rah, rah halftime speech. It was like, what do we want to do? What do we want to accomplish? How do we want to get there? And they came out 29 yard run by Jason McClellan, then 46 yard shot by you know, Milrow to bond, um, you know, and again, that was one of those plays where it's like, you know, Milrow needs to have a better sense of where the pass rush, like where it's coming from and where it's going. And that play was the perfect encapsulation of that. I thought the edge rushers from Tennessee got pretty good push. Um, you know, they kind of made life difficult, obviously on the tackles, but Milrow stepped up calmly cocked back through and, you know, for whatever reason, Tennessee secondary just let Isaiah Bond run right by them again. And he was wide open for a touchdown. And at that point, it was only 20 to 14. But I mean, even I said in the press box, I was just like, all right, like this, this is going to get interesting, right? Because it was just bang, bang, yep. Alabama's on the board. And I mean, even you said that, like, they need to come out with some sort of response. I don't think we were anticipating a two play 75 yard drive response. Um, but that obviously injected some juice into the place and, and it really got the ball rolling. 
Yeah, no, hundred um, percent. If I'm laughing, thinking about like if any, if for some reason some poor Tennessee fan has stumbled upon this podcast and is listening, they're probably screaming that you know their rushers were held on that play because I saw that all over Twitter. Tennessee fans were very mad about uh, feeling like there was holding on that Bond touchdown play, but you know I, I think I agree with you. I think that was that was the play that injected a lot of juice into that stadium. Obviously, it injected a lot of, I think, juice on that sideline. I think that play gives you a lot of confidence. Like, hey, like, we can do this. Like, it's not over yet. And then, again, I felt like Tennessee started to unravel, really, after that moment. There was, you had that weird, um, what's it called? I'm blanking. Um, fair catch. I mean, that was weird. Like, the, Tennessee just did some weird stuff after that where I felt like, you know, the moment kind of got to them. And, you know, it, it all started really with that Mill Road to Bond touchdown. I mean, it was huge. Yeah. And uh, to the to the stray Tennessee fans that just so happened to stumble upon Roll Pod, one, welcome. We're glad you're here. Two, um, I, I know Tennessee fans were like livid over the whole penalty thing. And I at the end, I, I'll be honest, I found it a little curious, too. Not that the penalties were as lopsided as they were, but just the fact that Alabama only had one penalty called against them. When you look at the previous four games, they had six penalties against Mississippi, six penalties against Mississippi state, 14 against a and five against Arkansas. Like, you know, they, they feel like they had gotten into a rhythm of just kind of puking on themselves, you know, for a series or two every game. And they just didn't. So like, I kind of want to see that. Like I'm going to be paying attention to it on the rewatch. So come on back to Bama 247 if you want to read about that. Yeah. Um game MVP. There were obviously a lot of really key plays and and big time playmakers throughout this game for Alabama, especially in the second half. Who, in your view, is the game MVP? Well, I joked that I might do this, and I think I'm just gonna do it. I'm gonna I'm gonna lean into um the group. It's a group of people who Nick Saban made it a point to thank after the game. And that's the fans. I think that this is a a group of people who have seen a lot of success over the years. Um, you know, the makeup of the student body has changed over the years. You know, I just it's there's you just you get, you know, it's like the the classic things about hogs getting slaughtered. You know, I think at a certain point, like you might get a little complacent. Um, maybe the joy that you experience for the first time doesn't quite invoke that same feeling out of you. And I think Brian Denny, as great as it is and as great as the fan base has been, I think it got a little sleepy for a couple of years. You know, it just wasn't, it just wasn't that kind of feeling that need that I have to scream as loud as I can and not have any voice after the end of the game for my team to win because they were so dominant, but clearly Nick Saban, before this game realized like we need you guys like this is going to be a battle it could come down to the last play and that crowd last year at tennessee was one of the loudest crowds i've ever heard in my entire life covering college sports like it was deafening at the end of that game especially when will record kicked his field goal he missed like it was just a, extremely loud and i think nick saban realized that had an impact on that game like we need you guys to bring that on saturday and again i think it you know it was little weird first half i think the fan base was kind of shell-shocked wasn't really sure what to make of it it's never fun to be down 27 at the half but i thought that the crowd was was electric in the second half clearly made a big impact on those two false start penalties uh when when tennessee was in the red zone at the end of that game Uh, it just felt like again it felt like the tennessee got a bit rattled and i think the crowd just kept getting louder and louder and louder and ultimately helped play you know a, a role in in alabama winning so I, I thought that was uh important obviously nick saban running over to thank the fans was unusual rare i think he obviously realized the importance talked about the energy that 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 the fans provided to the team uh, in the game and sometimes when again when it's close when it's razor thin that that home field can make a big impact and i thought against tennessee that it did um it was so abnormal Saban going over to thank the fans and like even even some of the players ran over to various parts of the student section and, um, you know, thanking them and hyping them up. And, you know, that was it was it was so I, I guess I don't want to say it was abnormal. It was probably abnormal for Saban. Right. Because that's I, it's ultimately what you ended up writing your column about. Um, but I like, can only was, remember him doing it. Now, I could be wrong because I haven't been to every single game over the last decade, but 
I can I remember him doing it in 2015. It was on the road at Georgia. It was like pouring rain. They won. A bunch of fans stayed through the rain, and he kind of ran over to basically thank him, like thanks for staying through the rain and cheering us on. That's the only one that I really jumped out to me that I could remember. I don't really remember him doing it at home that I can think of. Um, again, somebody listening to the podcast, if you can remember seeing it, tell us, let us know. But at a minimum, it does not happen much. I mean, I have the last few seasons, I definitely haven't seen it. Yeah. So there was a call to action and the fans answered. So that's, that's, I, I like that as a game MVP pick. I'm going to go with uh, somebody that actually put pads and a helmet on. Um, Jihad Campbell, um, a guy who, I mean, he obviously played a great game today today saturday he played a great game 10 total tackles had a tackle for loss he was in on both of the fourth and short stops um and then also had the uh um, he scooped the fumble in the fourth quarter and took it 24 yards to the house um he did that typical defensive player thing where it's like i should probably just fall on the ball but i'm gonna wait a beat to see if i can actually pick it up and run like he did kind of a little sidestep shuffle um, and to his credit, he pulled it off, like scooped the ball up, ran 24 yards, scored the touchdown that effectively iced the game. Um, we got to hear from him for the first time. Um, you know, we asked Saban about him. I mean, this is a guy that, you know, Alabama's base defense, right? Like it is Deontay Lawson and Tresman Marshall in the middle. Um, both of those guys have had to miss time over the course of the season, right? Like Lawson had an ankle thing. Tresman Marshall is currently dealing, dealing with bruised ribs. So he did not, I think he only played like eight snaps or something on Saturday. So Jihad Campbell has kind of been that third guy and he's a very versatile third guy. I mean, he was obviously a superstar recruit, um, but a very, like very talented, versatile guy who has been taking advantage of his opportunities. Like he has played a lot this season and he has played very, very well. Like he, you know, 13 tackles or something like that against Mississippi State when Lawson couldn't play, had another double digit tackle performance against um, Tennessee. Um, like this is a, this is a dude, like this is a player. And, you know, among the, you know, defense played really, really well. Among the other things that I've really liked about the way the defense has played the last few weeks. Um, we're starting to see a lot of really good depth like come through. Like on the defensive line, there's a lot of young guys who've kind of made their way into the rotation. Jihad Campbell in the middle, Quandarius Robinson normally stars on special teams, but he's had some moments the last few weeks on defense specifically. Um, you know, and then in the secondary too, and I, I this is one of the things I'm probably gonna lead the rewatch with. Um, so come back to Bama 247 on Monday morning to read this, but like Trey Amos, like Terry and Arnold ultimately missed the second half with a concussion. Trey Amos came in and played very, very well. Um, and he, he's had to do that kind of in spots. You know, I know, I think what Kool-Aid may have missed a series. So Trey Amos had to play, um, you know, when Malachi Moore went down against A&M, mm -hmm. on had to shift to star, which brought Amos back in to play most of that second half. Um, but yeah, Campbell's one of those guys, like he doesn't, you know, I, he's obviously got a defined role as a middle linebacker, but he doesn't always get a ton of snaps. When he does get a lot of snaps, he played 73 snaps out of 81 total defensive snaps on Saturday. Um, he makes the most of his opportunity, and it was really fun to, you know, see him shine in the bigger moments on Saturday. And it's just been really fun to see guys like that get the opportunities that they get throughout the course of the season. And, you know, I don't know that Alabama is where they're at without those guys doing the things that they need to do. You know, some of those dirty work, you know, second third string guys coming in and, and making plays when they need it yeah what is one question you have about this alabama team moving forward they're now seven and one they've hit the bye week they are still undefeated in sec play they are still at the top of the west they've got a really big game coming out of the bye week against lsu who again we've talked about number one offense in the country in terms of total offense and scoring offense. That's kind of, I don't want to shrug off the rest of the month of November, but like that LSU game is like the game and it has, that's where we're at at this point in the season. It was the game last year. It is the game against this year. Um, we've got a week plus to chew on this particular matchup, but what's, what's a question you've got about Alabama coming out of this game, looking ahead into the LSU matchup. Yeah, I'll try to keep it short and sweet. I feel like we're already running long here, and I want to leave something for you guys to talk about during the week. Um, but I just think it's the offense. I, mean, I think it's can the offense hold serve. You know, I think we know that, uh, again, we've talked a lot about the defense today. I think that the defense is very good. Um, they're going to have their hands full with LSU. Um, they are dominant right now, and Daniels is the, really the, the engine that makes that team go. They struggled last year in containing Daniels. 
Um, I think it was frustrating at times for how they were just not able to bottle him up. It's going to be a challenge again. Um, but I think I put more of that on the offense. The offense has to be able to sustain some drives. They've got to have some momentum. They can't just keep giving the ball back to LSU and forcing because eventually they're going to get you. Daniels will get you eventually. And so you've got to try to slow it down a little bit, maybe burn some clock, get some run game going. I, I just think that's going to be really important. So we'll see what uh, over the next two weeks or so Alabama can come up with um, and maybe get off to a hotter start like we talked about earlier, because I think that's ultimately it's the offense that's going to decide that game. Yeah, I think the offense is probably going to have to set the tone in a game like that. Um, you know, I, I don't know if that's a game where the offense takes the ball first. Um, you know, I don't know if we want to get too knee deep into those types of weeds. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's 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 my question. Can, what what can you solve or what can you improve on over the next, you know, over the bye week? Like maybe it's a matter of just getting rest. I don't know if there's anything like huge that you can overhaul with the offense. But like there's, you know, they, they've got to clean some things up. They got to figure out just, you know, even a tick or two more. Uh, they got to be a little, a tick or two more efficient. You know, I think if, if, you know, you don't want to get in a track meet with LSU, but a team like LSU, just the way that they're playing offensively, like that is entirely possible. Um, it could also be entirely possible that Alabama's defense comes out and shuts them down. And this is a totally moot conversation and they're moving forward through the month of November. Um, yeah. I think that just, you know, again, that just kind of speaks to the nature of this Alabama team. Like we just don't really know what they're going to get. Um, but yeah, I think that the question I have moving forward is just the, the, the offense, the efficiency of it, the consistency of it. And really like you can't go punt punt to start the game against LSU. You can try. It's a hard way to live. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but like, let's, let's see. A, I, I want to see a better first 15 against the Tigers. I think they're going to need it in a game like that. Um, and you've got two weeks to prepare for it. So like if they come out punt punt against LSU to start offensively, um, got going to have even more questions maybe than, than we have currently. And I know we have a lot. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that's a question, but that's just like a thing that I will be thinking about over the yeah. course of the bye week. Um, that was, uh, that's Alabama, Tennessee, John, you got any, uh, final thoughts before we wrap up here? No, I think we covered it. It was, uh, it was an entertaining one all the same. Um, but we have reached the bye week and Alabama has everything still in front of them, a direct line to the SEC championship game in Atlanta, so long as they take care of business. And perhaps, perhaps, we'll see how everything else shakes out, a potential berth in the college football playoff on the line at the same time. Um, that's all we've got today. In the meantime, be sure to rate and review the show wherever you listen to your podcast, Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, even our Bama 247 YouTube page. We will be back sometime this week. I think I'm going to get our recruiting guy, Brett, back on the horn. We're going to talk a little bit of recruiting both football and basketball. Alabama just got done with, um, what, two consecutive home games. I got another one coming up against LSU, so we'll check in with him on some of the recruits that have been visiting Tuscaloosa who will plan on visiting Tuscaloosa after the bye week. Um, and then we'll also touch on some basketball stuff since that season starts in oh a week. You know, let's uh, let's get ready for that nonsense. Um, and then we'll probably be back. I think tentatively, I want to try and keep the midweek Sunday rhythm going. So maybe John, I don't know if you're into it now. We can talk about it later. Um, we'll obviously be keeping tabs on the rest of the college football world this season or this weekend, even though Alabama's not playing. So maybe we'll hop back up on Sunday and, uh, you know, discuss what all we saw, what all it means and just kind of a bigger outlook on college football and maybe, um, you know, kind of how Alabama fits into that puzzle, um, you know, coming out of the bye week So, um, we'll see, we'll see. Uh, we'll obviously keep you guys up to date on what we do that. Uh, in the meantime, also subscribe to Bama two, four, seven and two, four, seven sports guys. You can get a subscription for a dollar a month to start then just $10 a month thereafter for the best coverage of your favorite team. Take advantage of that, especially if you're an Alabama fan. Thank you so much, John, for joining me again. Thank you so much again, you guys for listening and we will talk again soon.